listen to the defense of your thesis. So before that, um, I have the pleasure of sharing your jury. I'm going to introduce the members of the jury, the one that are present today and the one that could not attend for a different reason. We are sorry about that. So um, we are the first the, per the person that uh, wrote the report for your thesis. There is a, a professor Philippe Fresse from the uh, University of Montpellier. Uh, professor Marianne Benevitz that could not attend because she is sick from the uh, University of Freiburg, which is professor also. Um, also, Eki Yoshida uh, from AIST in uh, Japan could not attend. Hopefully, we are here. So, we are welcoming Setu uh, Vijaya Kumar, which is professor at the University of uh, Edinburgh in Scotland. And um, your uh, thesis advisor, who is uh, Olivier Stas, and myself, Philippe Swear, director of the research at CNRS. So, you, you have uh, approximately uh, 45 minutes for presenting your work, then you will, we will ask some questions. So, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here today, especially as the members of my jury. Okay, let me start with telling you why I'm here today. And I'm here because I'm really fascinated by artificial intelligence. I'm fascinated by the prospect that one day we might be able to understand the underlying principles of intelligence and we might be able to create autonomous machines which can help us in different scenarios, for example, elderly care, disaster response, or even space exploration. So the question is, how can we understand intelligence? And during my undergraduate studies, I stumbled upon this book called Understanding Intelligence by Rolf Pfeiffer. And in it, he's vehemently arguing for the embodiment hypothesis. The idea that cognition, the set of our all mental abilities, requires a body. So, why do we need a body? Let me give you three examples. On the left, you see a bicycle with square wheels. And so if you don't have any knowledge about a bicycle, the question is, how can we infer the functionality of this bicycle? And for me, it's clear that we need to go there. We need to interact with different parts to discover the functionality of this bicycle. And the second example, if we want to interact with the world, for example, if we want to uh, grasp an object and put it somewhere else, we need the body to be able to do this manipulation. And also in disaster response scenarios, if there are people which need help, we need the body to go there and help them. And all those examples have something in common. We need to do motion planning for them. So motion planning is an essential component for all of them. So let me go a little bit into details here. So for discovering this functionality here, during my bachelor thesis, I worked on a topic called interactive perception. So the idea here is that for discovering what this bicycle can do, we first need to understand its mechanical structure. And to understand the mechanical structure, we need to interact with the bicycle to discover how the parts are connected. And I worked on a very specific topic, namely how are two components linked to each other. So you see here this toy train. There are like two parts which are moving through space. And I worked on discovering what are the joints which connect these. And you can see here this magenta line is a rotational joint which is discovered by our algorithm. And what I found out is that this problem is actually easy or hard depending on what kind of motion we apply to interact with this object. So motion planning is really essential for the complexity of the future problem. And another topic, statistical symbolic planning, on which I worked during my master thesis. Um, the idea here is that Sometimes we want to have symbolic actions, like grasp the cylinder. And um, those actions in a real world can be noisy. For example, um, if our camera image is not perfect, or if our motors have not the correct um, numbers, then we can um, come to outcomes which are not desirable. So for example, in this example here, um, we did some motions on the environment. We tried to grasp some cylinders. And in 60% of the cases, the 
cylinder was grasped, and in the other cases, it fell on the floor or some other noisy um, outcomes. So I worked on a global optimization strategy to optimize the predicted outcome which we want, namely the one where the cylinder is in the hand. And you can see here, um, depending on this optimization, we have very different motion plans. So for example, this the non-optimized, we have a very jerky movement. With the optimized, we have a very smooth movement. And so what I discovered is really that motion planning, the underlying structure of the problem is very important to be able to um, optimize over a symbolic action. And in disaster response scenarios, so this year we saw at the DARPA Robotics Challenge uh, robots working on very challenging tasks. Um, however, they were semi-autonomous, so they were controlled by uh, a human operator. And what you can see here is that even with kill operation, um, a robot is very unstable. So um, it does not really have the capability to act robust in an environment. And so motion planning also here is an essential component to make those robots more autonomous so that they can um, not fall down in disaster response scenarios. And so our final goal is really to um, have something which is approximately like this. So this is a study from 1924 from Wolfgang Kohler called The Mentality of Apes. And you can see here an ape trying to grasp a banana high on the ceiling. And it really displays uh, displays a lot of different, very intelligent uh, aspects. So it can stack boxes on top of each other. It knows how to balance on those boxes, and it knows how to communicate with other apes to uh, build such structures. So I'm not going to tackle all those problems here, but I want to show you just the long-term goal of uh, this research. And so from understanding intelligence, we now come to a very specific aspect, namely understanding of motions. And understanding motions from a very as, uh, abstract aspect can be defined very simple. So what we need to do is actually just to span the space of all possible motions, which we call the configuration space. And then we need to choose one of those motions, which we do by motion planning. And then we are done. However, this problem is very, very hard. Namely because, first of all, this problem can be very high dimensional. So for example, this robot here can have up to 35 degrees of freedom if we ignore the hands. And so we would need to span a space of 35 dimensions in which we need to find a motion. Then second, in 1979, John Rife proved that the problem of choosing one motion from this configuration space is actually NP-hard. So it's proven that there's no efficient algorithms to solve the problem. And on top of this, we have very often a pinhole character in this configuration space. So for example, if you look at the picture here, then the robot can go through the wall only on a very tiny uh, configuration. So it has to choose one specific configuration from this whole configuration space. And if you do just random sampling in this huge space of motions, then the probability to find exactly this specific configuration approaches uh, zero in practice. And so what I want to stress today is the hypothesis that by exploiting the structure of space of motions, we can actually have more efficient motion planning algorithms. And so to um, define what I mean by the structure of the space, I want to go now a little bit into the definitions of motion planning. So motion planning can be defined by those five entities. So we have the robotic system, the configuration space C, QI is the initial configuration of our robot, QG is the goal configuration of our robot, and E is the environment. And now to span the space of all motions, we do the following. So we have QI and QG, which is our initial configuration and our goal configuration. And we say F of QI, QG is a set of all continuous functions which start in QI and which go to QG. 
And for one specific trajectory from this functional space, we denote by SV of tau the step volume. So on the left, you see a contact transition of a robot, and you can see the step volume of the robot, which is defined as uh, the volume occupied by the robot during this transition. And now we say that uh, this trajectory is feasible in an environment if the set volume of this trajectory intersected with the environment is the empty set. And one very, very important notion for motion planning is the notion of completeness. We say that an algorithm is called complete if it finds a feasible trajectory in this functional space if one exists or reports that no such exists. So being complete is really the ultimate goal of any motion planning algorithm which we want to develop. And so I told you I want to study the structure of space. And studying the structure of space um, can be done by topology, the mathematics of topology. So if you haven't heard about topology before, um, you can just think about it as the structure of space in a very formal manner. And what you need to know for this presentation today is just the notion of a homotopy class. So if you look at this picture, then you can see that if you want to go com from QI to QG, there's actually a natural decomposition based on continuity. So if you want to go uh, down here, then you can see that all the functions here can be continuously deformed into each other. And all the functions which can be continuously deformed into each other is called homotopy class in topology. And by doing this continuous deformation, we preserve continuity. And so this is very important because for me, this is really the boundary, the, the border between control theory and motion planning, how I see it. So in control theory, we are more interested in local optimization. So normally, uh, control theory problems are formulated in optimization problem which is continuous. So we are interested in local completeness inside of homotopy class, and we are interested in the preservation of continuity. While for motion planning, I see it more global in the sense that we want to know which homotopy class are there, how can we identify them, how are they globally connected, and also how can we choose one of the homotopy classes. And so what are my contributions? So the first contribution are feasible subspaces where we pre-compute feasible motions in dynamic environments. And so the idea is really to find representatives of each of those homotopy classes so that we can find one representative and we can give it, for example, to a controller which can do some continuous deformation of this initial trajectory. The second contribution, um, there we will talk about dimensionality reduction and we will introduce a new concept which we call irreducible trajectories, which is a completeness preserving dimensionality reduction technique. And afterwards we will really talk about how we can capture the underlying structure of the space by doing homotopy planning, by identifying what are the homotopy classes in an environment, by having a convex decomposition of those homotopy classes, and by doing continuous motion planning in one of those homotopy classes. And so let me start with feasible subspaces. And for this, I want to show you a very, very hard problem, which we call the children's toy room problem. So consider on the right here, the robot wants to go to a room where there are a lot of obstacles on the floor. So you could think about that there are some child has put a lot of his toys on the floor. And the robot needs to avoid stepping on all those obstacles, and he needs to cross the room. And there's a very interesting notion towards the topological complexity of motion planning, which is which was introduced in 2003 by Michael Faber, which basically says that uh, the more homotopy classes we have, the harder the problem gets. And in this example here, you could think about that you can go to the left or to the right of an obstacle if you cannot step over it. And this would introduce a split in the continuity and so for n objects, you would have something like 2 to the power of n homotopy classes. And to solve this problem, we based, uh, we based our approach on an existing work by Nicolas Perrin, one of the previous PhD students in our lab. And 
he had the idea to approximate the feasibility between two footstep transitions. So you can think about um, that you do just one step in the environment and you want to know if the step will be feasible or not. And so we start on the top left, we have xi, which is the start foot, and xg is the uh, final foot step. And what we do to move the robot from one foot step to another is to use the controller. Um, and once we have this controller, which moves our robot, we can compute the swept volume of the robot. And to know if this step is feasible, we need to do collision checking with the swept volume and the obstacles, the objects in the environment. And then we have a binary output if it's feasible or not. And the basic idea of Nicolas Perrin was to introduce a swept volume approximation. So very often we have only very specific controllers which we use to do these transitions, for example, a walking pattern generator. And if we already know this and we have a discrete set of footsteps, then we can actually pre-compute swept volumes. And by doing this, we can do directly this collision checking in the environment to very fast access if a footstep is feasible or not. And when I actually uh, arrived, I had, uh, I had just absolvated a master's program in machine learning. So for me, this whole problem looked really like something where we have some input and some output, and we could like directly learn a function which goes from the input to the output. So what I did is to identify what is our input, which is the footsteps and the objects, and our output is actually the feasibility, this binary decision. So this actually looks like a uh, classification problem. And so what I did is that I directly learned this function by using a very uh, standard machine learning algorithm uh, neural network. And what you can see here by doing this approximation with the machine learning algorithm, we scale much better than the previous work. So in green you see um, the swept volume approximation of Nicolas Perrin, and in red the feasibility computation by machine learning. And depending on the number of objects in the environment, which you saw before, um, we have here the time on the left, and we can see that even if we have 60 objects in the environment, we are still almost in real time, under one second planning time. And we implemented this in a virtual environment, and you can see here the children's toy room problem, and the robot tries to find its way towards this magenta dot, which is the goal. And we're also here uh, moving the small obstacles on the floor. And you can see that the robot is able to replan its motion in real time to adapt to the change in the environment. And we also shown that this works on the real robot in a collaboration with Airbus. And here, the robot is walking through a factory and suddenly there's a toolbox in the way and the robot is able to plan a new motion which goes around the toolbox towards the goal. And it seems that we solved this problem, but actually we haven't given any real guarantees. We just applied some machine learning algorithm to approximates function. And I would like to give you the citation from Michael Jordan, one of the most prominent machine learning researchers in the field. He said, we can't just hope that things work. Eventually, we have to give real guarantees. And this is really the motivation for our second contribution, where we introduce irreducible trajectories. So what are irreducible trajectories? Um, we go back to our functional space from QI to QG, and we take now two configuration space trajectories, which we call tau and tau prime. And we have this definition here of an irreducible trajectory. We say that if the swept volume of tau prime is a subset of the swept volume of tau, then tau prime reduces tau. And if no such tau prime exists, then tau is called irreducible. And to visualize this to you, 
Here we have a very small robot with two links, which can move in the plane, which you can see here. And the robot can only move up, and there's a small dot where the robot can rotate its second link. And on the right, you see three different trajectories, and the thread volume of those trajectories. And by applying our definition of an irreducible trajectory, we see that the first trajectory is actually a subset of the other two. And what we say is that the first trajectory reduces the other two, and the first trajectory is actually an irreducible trajectory. So why is this important for motion planning? It is important because we have this theorem here. So first, we span now the space of all irreducible trajectories. So you can think about that we have this whole space of motions, and now we take a subspace of these motions, the space of all irreducible trajectories, and we have this theorem which states that if we cannot find a feasible motion in the small subspace of motions, then we cannot find any motion in the whole space of, of motions. And what follows from this is directly that motion planning preserves this completeness in the small subspace. And if we go back here to this graphic, then you can see that if the first uh, trajectory, if there is an obstacle, for example, at this position, and this is not feasible anymore, then we can directly say that those two are also not feasible because this is actually a subset of them. So for motion planning, we can ignore the other two trajectories. And now we applied this to a linear linkage structure. So the most, the, the difficult problem here is actually that this is a very abstract notion and we do not know how to analytically define this irreducible trajectory space. However, we can apply it to some very simple mechanical systems. And so we applied it to a serial chain system, which we call here uh, a linear linkage. And so the idea is that, for example, if we look at a snake, an octopus, and a humanoid robot, then we can see that all their mechanical structures have something in common. And we call this component here a linear linkage. And we can see that the snake has one linear linkage, and the octopus has eight, and the humanoid robot has four linear linkages. And if we want to plan for the linear linkage, we first say that the root link is just a second. So um, this linear linkage has a root link and at n sublinks, and now we want to find a motion for this linear linkage. So what we need to do is to send commands to the root link and to the n sublinks. And in the plane, this requires that we send three values to the root link and n values to the sublinks. So basically, we need to plan in three plus n dimensions. And this requires a lot of time and computational resources. So what we now found out is that if the root link moves through space on a curvature constraint curve by some curvature kappa, then we can actually always put all the sublinks into the swept volume of the root link. And this is a very important concept. So if we can always put the sublinks into the swept volume of the root link, then all the other possible configurations of the sublinks will only increase the swept volume of the root link. And so this is actually an irreducible trajectory here. And now if we are in a random environment, we can do motion planning by trying to find a trajectory for the robot which is constrained by a certain curvature kappa. And if we find one, we can always put all sublinks in the third volume. And now instead of planning in three plus n dimensions, we can plan in three dimensions, classical dimensionality reduction. And we can apply this to, for example, a snake. So if we are in a random environment, we can abstract the snake again here as a linear linkage. 
and we can try to find a curvature constraint curve for this linear linkage. And if we find one, we can just move along this curve towards the goal. And we implemented this. And here you can see the planning results in a random environment with stones in 2D. And we also implemented this in a 3D case where the where a swimming snake is swimming through a formation of rocks on an irreducible trajectory. And we can generalize this also to, to humanoid robots. So a humanoid robot, we can identify uh, the arms and one leg as a linear linkage. And we can now remove those links. And we can actually plan a motion for the rest of the body constrained by a certain curvature. And if we found a motion, then we can put all those remaining links back into the sweat volume of the motion. And we implemented this on the real robot. And you can see here that the robot is finding a motion through the wall on an irreducible trajectory. And now let me go a little bit more into details. I said that we can always find a, uh, a configuration such that we can project the configuration in to the third volume. So, but only if we are under some certain curvature. So um, we actually studied a two-link system, which you can see here on the left, which has a root link L0 and a sublink L1. And there is a maximum limit here, theta L, and the length between them is L0. And we found out that if the root link L0 moves on this certain curvature here, then we can always find a configuration of L1, which is irreducible. And this follows from the fact that L0 and theta L, they are spanning actually a cone. And you can see here, if this particle S on the right with direction S, S prime is constrained by this curvature kappa zero, then it will always uh, move out of this cone by crossing delta P zero. And if it does this, then we can always construct a configuration for L1. And so we also generalized this to multiple uh, sublinks. And we have, again, a certain curvature. And we showed that um, there's always a configuration. So we can always construct a certain configuration, which is inside of the swept volume of this root link. And now we can span a new space of functions constrained by the certain curvature. So we have the space of all functions, which are constrained by a certain curvature. And we have this notion here of curvature completeness saying that if an, an algorithm is curvature complete, if it finds a trajectory in the space of curvature constraint function, if one exists or reports that no such exists. So we can give real guarantees here in the case of uh, a linear linkage or a serial chain uh, manipulator. And we also have some experimental results uh, which were obtained in connection with uh, Olivier Roussel from our lab. And we did two experiments, one for the snake in this uh, random environment. And you can see here in the first row, if we plan for the snake with six sublinks, we would have a dimensionality of nine. And the planning time with some standard uh, random sampling would be around 100 seconds. However, if we apply our notion here of irreducibility, and if we plan in this reduced space, um, then we have three dimensions, and it turned out that we only need around one second on average to find a solution. So this is really an improvement by two orders of the magnitude. And in the second case, we consider the human robot going through this wall there on the top right. And in the general case, we have 35 dimensions, and we let our algorithms run, but even after three days, we, have, we had no results. However, with the reducibility, we are, can plan in seven dimensions. And we had some results, which took up to nine hours, which is a lot. But at least we, we got some results in this very, very challenging 
problem where the configuration space of feasible motions is very, very small. And at the end, I also want to show you that there's a lot of explanatory power for irreducibility. So on the left, we see a particular example from uh, the last Dapper Robotics Challenge. So a team thought that maybe it can fit through the wall, uh, through this door here on the left, much better if it turns sideways. However, this is just a heuristic, and there was no theoretical explanation for this. But if we apply this irreducibility, we could now say, okay, we go sideways because we actually minimize our swept volume by doing this. And on the right, um, a very nice game from Japan where there's a moving wall coming to people and those people need to be in a very specific configuration to be able to fit through the wall. And here we could actually also apply reducibility because this guy here, he could also just make himself very small instead of going like this. He could just put his arms at the body and he would still fit through it by applying this principle of irreducibility. And so, so far, um, we didn't really capture the structure of space and this is what we want to do now, so homotopy planning. What we want to do here is to really identify homotopy classes in an environment and to be able to do continuous motion planning. And to do this, we actually analyze the environment. So for example, here on the left, you see HRP2 going over some stepping stones. And what we did is actually to identify the surfaces on the stepping stones and their connectivity, which you can see here on the right. So what we extracted here from this environment is actually the surfaces where the robot can step on and how they are connected to identify what are the homotopy classes in the environment. And to do continuous motion planning in one of those homotopy classes, we used a very uh, basic result from function analysis, which states that every continuous function can actually be represented by linear combination of basis functions. So for example, we can choose a polynomial basis function, and then we represent our space by a linear combination of those basis functions. And if we want to do now planning in this decomposition of the homotopy class, so we always assume that we have a convex decomposition. If we don't have a convex decomposition, we just apply algorithms to approach this convex decomposition. So if we want to have now a path from xi to xg, we um, say that we just apply some constraints on this functional space, namely that the first point of our functions in xi, the last point in xg, and in between, in each of those uh, convex polytops, we are inside of the convex polytope during a certain time span of the function. And by doing this, we can actually construct a convex optimization problem by minimizing over those linear combinations of, of the factors of those linear combinations, um, constrained by being at the beginning xi, at the end xg, and in between on those polytopes, and also between two consecutive points on the function, we constrain ourselves to be below a certain step width. So we apply this to different stepping stones configurations. So for example, on the left, we would have a certain configuration where we have two homotopy classes. And you can see here in black, there are two different paths along the homotopy class. And on the right, we can see the same, but this time we have four homotopy classes and representative trajectories on them. And we can also do this, for example, for a staircase. So here in red, we identified surfaces on the steps. And in green and black, we have representatives of the homotopy classes. And now we can also generalize this concept. So on the left here, you see this wall again, which we saw at the beginning, um, in its polytope representation. And what we did here in the second picture is actually to find out what are the walkable surfaces, so the surfaces where the robot can step on. We do um, continuous motion planning on this one homotopy class which we found. 
And then on top of this, we do motion planning for a set of particles for the robot, which go to the wall. And we also have here some experimental results. So here on the left, you see uh, some of those particles in the specific configuration where the robot is going to the wall. And we saw before that for doing this with some random sampling, it took around nine hours. However, with this particle planning approach, it took around 60 minutes on this very specific um, example. And this is a video which um, we produced by applying this concept on the real robot platform. And so now I'm already at the end. So um, we investigated the hypothesis that by exploiting the structure of space, we can create more efficient motion planning algorithms. And I showed you three different structure elements which we exploited. The first was the feasible subspaces where we exploited the behavior of the robot, namely a specific controller which the robot is using. In the second, irreducible motions, we exploited the mechanical structure of the robot. In the third, we exploited the environment, the, the homotopies which we found in the environment. And so what we got from this was actually a deeper understanding of the structure of the motion space, which led us actually to more efficient planning algorithms. And so concerning future research, um, the first is that we are always planning in a static environment so far. However, in the real world, the robot can uh, be in a situation, for example, where there are a lot of homotopy classes opening and closing. So for example, here, if the robot wants to cross the street, there are a lot of cars coming, and you could see that there are a lot of homotopy classes which are not static, but they are opening and closing, and the robot has to choose which one it can uh, take so that it can cross the street. So it has to uh, choose one of the homotopy classes which are most persistent in a specific environment. And a second to come back to uh, this topic from my master thesis, where we optimized uh, a symbolic action. Now that we got more understanding of how the motion actually works, and we know more about the underlying factors, we can actually use those factors to uh, be able to optimize our uh, symbolic action in a more meaningful way. And then we are also wanting to uh, apply our concept of irreducibility to multi-contact planning. So it's, so far we only ap uh, applied our concept of irreducibility to free floating bodies, for example, the snake or the arms of a robot which are not in contact. However, it's very important, especially for stabilization, to be in contact. And we think that it's also possible to apply our concepts of irreducibility to the case where a robot is in contact or a snake is in contact with the environment. And so I would like to end this presentation by this painting from Caspar David Friedrich, The Walker Above the Sea. Um, this is actually a very nice allegory for my PhD thesis. Um, the sea you see represents the structure of space and the walker it's me or you. And when I started the PhD, the whole sea here was really foggy. I didn't see anything. Um, but it turned out that there are a lot of structural components in the sea which we can exploit and I worked on a very specific topic, but I tried to remove some of the fog, and I hope for the future that we will be able to remove all the fog and um, to generalize our results so that we can have more efficient motion planning algorithms. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> So thank you, Andrea. 
Uh, we are now going to the s sequence of questions, so I will give first uh, the word to um, your first uh, referee. Okay. okay. So, um, Philippe Fraisse. Uh, I give you the microphone. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, Philippe, um, I want like to congratulate you. First of all, I really appreciate your thesis document was very clear, well written, and uh, there are many contributions, uh, and, um, and from my opinion, a major outcome uh, concerning a uh, reducive um, aspect. Um, I have, um, okay, and uh, it was, uh, I want to congratulate you about uh, your presentation because it was a nice presentation, well illustrated, and uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I have a question, <laughs> uh, about uh, uh, the steep uh, trajectories, mm -hmm. because uh, 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 I suggest many things in my uh, report, but uh, this is not uh, uh, a uh, It's about uh, how did you um, choose the root uh, link? In the case of a brain chain, I mean, uh, in human read robot, because for snake it's uh, straightforward, for octopus yeah. also, but uh, for a robot it's not straightforward to shoot the, the trunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, could you? Uh, well, so so actually, uh, the concept uh, developed from our uh, investigation about human read robots. So we saw that uh, it's gives us no additional information to, for example, um, investigate if we can go like this through the wall. Mm -hmm. If we already saw that we cannot go like this to the wall, then this gives us no more information. So we were sure that we have to uh, abstract away the, the arms of the robot in some meaningful way. And this was really the motivation why we have chosen the, the chest or uh, and the shoulder as the root link. And the arm actually as as saplings. Okay, because the the, the definition uh, that you mentioned in, in your document is the swept uh, volume of the sublink mm -hmm. is the subset of the swept volume of the rotting, mm -hmm. uh, right? Yes. But uh, the legs are two linear linkages as well, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So in, in the video, uh, the slide of forty six, for example. Normally, if we consider uh, the sublink as a subset of the the swap volume of mm -hmm. the road link, normally the the human robot uh, should uh, fight and uh, and goes yes yes uh, with the chest. I, 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 I see your point. Front. Yes. Um, so ac actually, um, in this case, we uh, consider this as connected. So we would say that the first knee is the root link, the second knee is the sublink, the first foot is the root link, the second is the sublink, because we don't yet have um, a consistent mathematical framework to model two links which are side by side. Okay. So for example, if, if I want to go to the wall, instead of going like this, I could also go like this. Yeah, right. Right. Yes. But it's very uh, hard to model this mathematically. Okay. Um, so we have not yet uh, a consistent framework for doing this. So this is why we um, concentrated on this because this is much easier to model mathematically. And um, for the legs, we, we yeah did this approximation of having like a set of linear linkages. Okay. Oh, because uh, it's more complicated than yes. a snake a robot. And uh, okay, thank you. Um, and. Uh, then, would it be possible to consider um, a root link uh, uh, on the end effector or not? Uh, on the arm or no? Would be yes. I mean, theoretically, this would be possible, but um, I, I don't know really to how to model this at the moment. I mean, uh, it makes sense to consider the chest, for example, as a root link. Mm -hmm. Then I know how to model it. But if I model it as the end effector then I need to also think about the chest. And then we have something which um, is not a linear linkage anymore. I, I mean, I, a serial chain anymore. Yeah. And so we need to 
think about how this uh, connects. But we haven't done this before, so far. But but I think it's it's uh, something which we have to look into. Okay, and there's a question about the, your first contribution uh, about uh, the precompetition of the feasibility of contact tracing and a comparison with uh, in terms of result and contribution with the uh, topic particular motion in terms of application because mm -hmm. you provide two um, experimentations. Mm -hmm with more or less the same uh, aspect because you can avoid all obstacle mm -hmm. and could you uh, detail and compare the both both contributions and uh, the difference and oh, oh you mean uh, in, in terms of application you, you address the same we, we address basically the same application yeah and we, we are also um, constrained by the same limitations um, however, uh, our work is based really on machine learning algorithms, so we might be, uh, we might not capture as many environments as the web volume approximation before. Um, so as, as I said, it's, it's very, uh, it, it's not very nice to have no guarantees, so I cannot quantify how many environments we capture or how many environments which we not capture, which the other algorithm can capture, but we are addressing the same problems in terms of applications. Yeah. So this is... So this is the idea, okay. Yeah. That's where you can, can compare, okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, it's fine. I, I, I would like uh, um, to congratulate you again. Uh, I, I really appreciate your work and uh, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Philippe. Um, I give not given now the the floor to Setu Vijaya Kumar about uh, machine learning. I guess. Thank you again, and uh, again, um, very well written thesis, and I think uh, it's got some um, good fundamental um, results, different way of thinking, uh, which I think can potentially be expanded to uh, give. Um, you know, more fundamental progress in this field. Because I think, uh, I agree with you, that I think when you get more complex robots and more complex environments, uh, things like contacts, then perhaps we need a slightly different way of thinking about the maths underlying it. Uh, because scalability, just by expanding the computations alone, may not work. So I think I think that's a good, good way of thinking about this problem. <coughs> so, um, so first of all, I had a question about the limitations of the method. So I think it's great to present uh, uh, this work. And you also mentioned your thesis a little bit about the limitations. Uh, uh, maybe I want to dig a bit deeper into, uh, because I think, I think knowing the limitations of your method is the best uh, sort of uh, acknowledgement of the fact that you've got complete grasp of the subject. So, uh, so I think I want you to try and, and explain to me, especially in terms of the relationship between irreducible spaces and, say, uh, the different poses that it subsumes underneath it. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think about the conservatism of your solutions? Do you think it's a conservative? What comes out is a conservative solution, or where does it? Um, you know, what, what do you think about the nature of the solution that comes out? Um. Yeah, so, so I, I think it's it's definitely uh, conservative in some ways, so we cannot apply it to all possible motion planning problems. So there are some problems where we have specific tasks. For example, if I want to grasp something, then I would not be uh, able to take advantage of this irreducibility anymore. However, um, there are certain situations where we can really uh, apply this to be much lower dimensional when we are sure that we don't need to um, use those sublinks for specific tasks. And in this case, we can apply this. So we, in the future, we need to really make a trade-off between um, applying this concept and knowing what kind of task which we have, which needs uh, to do something else which is outside of the scope of irreducibility. 
Okay, so I have a follow-up question. Yes. So in general, when you build a robot, you you do not build arbitrary linkages. You only build linkages because you want to use that robot to do something useful with that link. Otherwise, I would have just built a monolithic uh, thing which just kind of rotates in 2D space or, or, or goes around in the XY plane. Yeah. So, so from that point of view, uh, obviously, um, you are building additional linkages, additional degrees of freedom, because at some point you want to use it in space. So how easy is it to, uh, I understand that you can do kind of course planning for getting a robot from point A to point B, and then think about fine manipulation at a later stage. Yeah. Um, but how easy is it for your framework to switch between those two modes? Uh, well, at the moment we don't have yet included any, any tasks, for example. So, so if we don't know about the task, we cannot switch at all. Um, so we really concentrated on this very particular aspect. So I mean, of course, uh, so the next step would be to, to know what, what is the task, and especially what is um, the sub-manifold of the task in our configuration space, and how is it connected to the sub-manifold of irreducible motions in the configuration space. And then we need to know if we can still be on the reducibility manifold while following uh, this task okay. uh, manifold, basically, as yeah, is how, how I would okay. see it. Cool. Um. Okay, so I think uh, you mentioned that as well. Um, so just a clarification, uh, right at the beginning you said, I want to do something where the environment is dynamic. So, um, but towards the end, so it's this, in this case you showed that if I move things around, you can replan on the fly very quickly. Um, uh, but this doesn't uh, build, because you, in theory you would need to, to do it properly, you would need to, as you said in your last slide as well, you acknowledged that you would need to uh, both on the fly identify the number of homotopy classes uh, and then detect the presence and the absence of the, the, the sort of opening and closing of these classes um, because in the end the whole reason you're doing homotopy classes so that uh, when you sort of seamlessly transfer or you you you, you want to have some don't care conditions right because you want to do you want to say choose a high, at a high level homotopy one two or three and then do optimal planning inside that class mm -hmm. um, <coughs> but the whole point of discovery of the number of classes when the environment changes is a really hard one so do you think that um, there is hope to scale these things um, because it, it if you don't have a hope to do that um, any f sophisticated fancy methods you develop here uh, will not scale to, to when things move around, right? So what is your view on this? And this is an open-ended question. I don't think uh, it's a solved question. I just wanted to you, your reflection on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so so first of all, I think uh, it's, it's, it's very hard to choose from the high level point which of those classes to choose. Sometimes we can um, use some underlying factors which tells us if a class is good or bad. And so, for example, there's a very nice framework called uh, persistent homology, yes. uh, which tells us, okay, some of those classes might close very soon. So for example, in the case of the cars, and this would be one factor which we could use to, to decide this from, from a high level point of view. And so it really makes sense to be aware of what are the homotopy classes and then maybe concentrate on some of those classes. So for example, if we just consider something, some, some sampling method, we would like spend more time sampling in those good classes, more computational resources allocated there, where the factors are giving us some good results. But, but yeah? You will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that uh, position homology is in this, is in the what you're computing is, in, is it in the scale? Isn't in the scale of? Is it? It's with the scale, right? Not with the time. Uh, yeah, but but uh, I thought about it more like from time perspective. So how persistent is the homology over time? So okay. in the case of the car, if, if there is a big gap between cars, then there is a more persistent homology between them. 
and if there is a small space between cars and they are coming, then I have only very small homotopy class which will close very soon in the future. So I have to think about this persistency in time, basically. Thank you. Thank you, C2. So before I'm um, giving the floor to your thesis advisor, I will ask some uh, questions. Um, the first one is about the, this wall you use for uh, that kind of uh, text, of, text of every shape. Uh, so it was in initially built by Antonio El for for his uh, thesis. And I would like um, you to compare maybe the approach that was developed in uh, this thesis, where the idea was uh, not to get a specific projection, but to have a, a trajectory passing through. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we have it, and if we have a topological property, then it's always possible to approximate by a feasible movement. So this is one approach. Mm -hmm. And what you choose is to try to simplify the, the space by finding some um, kind of projection. So could you compare both approaches? Um, well, so, so I, I think um, Antonio considered a very general case where um, he has chosen some, some waypoints to go to the wall because he wanted to choose this very specific configuration. And in my work is actually that we discovered that this configuration is not everything, so we can actually also choose a very low dimensional um, configuration to go to this wall. And by using this structure, we can be more efficient. So uh, we don't even need waypoints to go this, to this wall. So this, this is the main point and this is the main difference, I think. Um, okay, so you will try to reduce the shape in the wall of that robot left when he passes instead of having, having a, a shape like this one, which is very strange. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. Okay, so um, concerning the conservatism of the method, yes. so uh, we see that we, we choose the direction of motion, so it's presented in terms of translation there, so you can extend to some rotation. Mm -hmm. So could you explain how we could expect to generalize that to the really 6D case where we have all the possible movement of the robot? Mm -hmm. um, so, so far what, what I showed here is actually that um, we have proven it in the 2D case. So, in the 2D case, we always know that we can project those uh, sublinks into the thread volume. Um, and we conjectured that we can do it also in the 3D case. We have some ideas on that, but we don't yet have any proof. However, we implemented it for 3D case, and we uh, showed this in the snake video in 3D that it's actually uh, possible. And um, so intuitively, I would say, yes, that is, that is true. So uh, what this would mean for a human robot is that he can actually um, move its chest on a curvature constraint curve through space. And by doing this, it can always uh, project um, its arm into the sweat volume in those cases where the arms are not needed. So this is like one method to, to you know, reduce the dimensionality in this case. Okay, so my last question is about the um, the function you develop, F, uh, of uh, FP, the, the first one, and um, you said that uh, the, using the machine learning uh, formalism, you were able to, to compute this feasibility faster than the swept algorithm by Nicola Perrin. Could you explain why the machine learning algorithm provides a better result? Mm -hmm. um, well, so, so First of all, it's very hard to, to answer this question because we don't have any guarantees with the machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, it is very often that machine learning algorithms actually capture some of the structure of a problem. And so it could be that by doing the set volume approximation, actually Nicolas Parang didn't thought about a specific structural component which has been um, which has been 
exploited here by our machine learning algorithms automatically. So, uh, and, and this is really also our motivation why we went further by trying to find out what are the structural components here to, to really quantify something. But, but I think this is the, the main uh, reason why the machine learning approach is better. Okay. Yeah. So thank you again and thank you for the, the quality of your presentation, which is in my sense uh, exceptional. <laughs> So Thank you. I will give now the microphone to Olivier Stas, your thesis advisor, for comments and maybe some questions also. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Andreas. So uh, uh, I, I have a comment, which I think is set a little bit your, your PhD. I really like your painting, the painting that you choose, because I think it, it really captures how you started your PhD. Uh, I am definitely not a machine learning specialist, so you are in the front line of something very foggy for me. And uh, so I just, I think, uh, much more um, continue with you. I think it was um, a joint um, journey into this path of uh, <laughs> trying to uh, lower down the dimensionality of motion planning for human and robots. And uh, what I would like to stress is, uh, apart uh, the first contribution, which was, uh, I think, I was at the basic uh, inception of this, and you, you, you put your own knowledge on this, what I would like to, to stress is that the two main other uh, contributions are almost solely yours. I just uh, make sure that everything was done properly. But it's definitely your ideas, and I think it's important to, uh, to stress that. So, uh, and we are very autonomous, which is very, uh, very nice for a PhD <laughs> supervisor. So, again, um, I know you, you, you really um, took uh, advantage of this uh, freedom I gave you at the beginning, uh, going into this uh, unknown landscape, and I think it's, uh, it's very nice. So, my only question would be um, uh, just a, a small summary. I would say that in the first case, um, we were started from the controllers, Okay, and we were trying to to see if we could capture the sweat, the, the volume spent by the controllers, mm -hmm. um, and and basically I think the the main difference with Nikolai is that the the collision checking with the object were done online with the collision checker. So basically, uh, I think what you capture in addition <laughs> with your object is the collision checking and the geometry spent by the the controllers and the possibility of the system. So. Um, because I think fundamentally uh, for us with Nicola, what we saw is that if you don't have collision checking, if you don't have geometry, we, you can build a feasibility function quite easily with a given memory space of nowadays computers. The fundamental compli complexity is the relationship between the controllers and geometry. And then you, I think for me, for the second part is you concentrate on how can you reduce geometry for the system. And in third part, you try to connect again both together. And for me, uh, the stepping stone, the connectivity is when you have only the line on the environment is this, uh, this wheel, human that uh, like very much example is that uh, how I can step inside my environment without any collision. And I think you are able to, you, you, you made a contribution along this direction. But then you have this very interesting articulation when the robot is going through the door. And I think it's slide um, 44. Yes, yes, when suddenly you are trying to make the connection, I think, with this line, giving the overall direction of the robot, and the fact that suddenly you have to take care of everything. The fact that you are in contact with the ground, the fact that you have to take into collision, that the system has to take care of the joints. And here we can we can see maybe some some I think that was part of the question of uh, the previous question is that do you think that irreducibility in some in some sense could be extended to the connection between geometry and the controllers where all their constraints and the fact that they are the underlying machinery to make the system work and which is a much more complex space and that will be my only question. Okay, um, yeah, I think there was um, a lot of very interesting works in the, in the last year, for example, um, for people trying to find out if a certain center of mass um, position for a given contact stance is feasible. And I think, uh, first of all, we need to really understand what is the whole space of possible 
center of mass positions in this case in the case of, of contact stability and then on the space we can apply our our concept of irreducibility to to maybe lower down the space but first of all i think really the, the next step must be to really quantify what what is the space and then we can apply our concepts so is that Thank you, Andreas. So it's now the end of the sequence of questions. So the jury is going to another, into another room to deliberate. And so we will back. one more? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> one more. So, don't it just make your life hard? But I think, I think it's... Uh, so, uh, again, I'm just curious. Um, so um, if you take a scenario where you take your irreducible pose, which is, uh, which is like, a, say, uh, something which is quite uh, arms and legs folded in and stuff, and let's say a robot is walking through uh, um, a, a thing and, and say you get some either noise or some interaction which changes the pose of the robot mm -hmm. but it is still possible through some surface, say your door or something like that. Um, but it is not part of your irreducible space anymore. Mm -hmm. So when a robot or a controller try to actively correct it back to a to irreducible space um, Manifold. Actually, I think this is a very interesting question. So um, this goes more into the um, yeah, in, in the field of how can we introduce a, a, a force into this framework. So, so if we know that, for example, we expect some force in the future, then we would actually know that we have to use our manipulator. So, for example, if, if I go to this uh, wall here. And suddenly there are some, some disturbances so that I know that now there are some forces, then this would actually uh, imply a task, a task of being stable. And now I have to really use my manipulator. So we cannot use the concept of reducibility anymore. We would switch to, to something where we can now make very fast, faster contact in the environment to, to guarantee the stability. No, no, I mean, I think yeah. it's more fundamental. It's more fundamental is uh, <coughs> so you know this notion of um, um, don't care conditions or in sort of no space um, uh, motion. Say, say in stochastic optimal control, you have this whole manifold of, of space of place where you've got. Uh, so in 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 a irreducible way of of planning a problem, you are highly constraining your solution to a w one particular thing, whereas yes. there are parts of space where you do not need to actually constrain it that much. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you can allow, you don't need to actively correct back because there are spaces, w w it is possible, right? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, that, so, I mean, it's, it's an interesting trade-off where you actively correct and control to stay within a manifold where, uh, which is great for planning because that helped you reduce your space of plans, but from a control point of view, you are probably doing some actions which are not necessary in, to actively correct. So, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, so, so uh, we really worked on um, finding out if the robot is geometrically feasible in this environment. And so th there's actually no force here. So, uh, it's, it's really a question how we can, can combine those two. So, uh, and yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting topic.